Amen. God bless you. Please grab a seat. And uh, I don't know what Ethan had for breakfast this morning, but I like it. Listen, we have more as followers of Jesus. We have more of a reason to celebrate than anybody else on earth. We have more of a reason to enjoy life. And so I think that is a good thing. This morning, it's like we're saying goodbye to an old friend. We're finishing the book of Romans. We've been in it for 30 weeks. We've covered 435 verses. In that time, we've seen in this room on Sunday mornings, 154 people give their lives to Jesus, which is incredible. It's incredible. And if you're a guest this morning, uh, normally in the past, we've done series four, five, six weeks long, but I really sensed God saying, hey, go through the book of Romans. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He wanted to go to Rome. He'd not gotten there yet, but he wanted them to understand theology. And theology is not simply opinions about life. God doesn't have opinions. He has truth. And it's important to know not only what we believe, but why we believe it. Because in those moments when life goes wheels off, it's not enough to know what you believe. Just because a mom or a dad or a grandparent or a pastor said, hey, this is what we believe, you want to know why. And it's important to own your own spiritual growth. And so Romans does an amazing job of showing us who God is, showing us a little bit about who our enemy is, and showing us our own desperate need for a personal, intimate, daily relationship with Jesus. So we can be connected to a God who invites us to call him Father. And he says there's one way to do that. We've learned in Romans that everything God creates, our enemy, the Bible says his name is Satan, counterfeits. Everything God builds, our enemy tries to destroy, and he often does does that through division. The word division really means two visions. So anything that brings division to God's vision is the enemy's work. And at some point, that battle will come into your life into your marriage, into your career, as you look into your future, there's going to be, if you're a follower of Christ, what you know the Bible says about things, and then there's going to be what culture says or the popular opinion of the day, and often the two of those will collide. And you reach a point in a place in life, as a follower of Jesus, you have to decide, is the word of God the word of God or not? Is the word of God the authority for my life or not? In the life of C3... We believe that the Bible is the inspired and infallible Word of God. We believe it has no mixture of error. We believe God wrote it and has protected it. And it is a book uh, not written just to us, but written for us. And it contains the meaning of life and how to live the best life. And we believe that God's always right. We believe He has an incredible track record of consistency in knowing that this thing called life, which was God's idea, knowing the best way to live it. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christ follower, We want you to know that you're welcome here. We want you to know that we're excited you're here. We're going to talk about some things in this passage this morning. And whether you're you're a Christ follower or not, I'm going to say some things this morning that some of you will not agree with. But that's okay. Because if you get three church people together, you have nine opinions. And so we all have thoughts. We all have thoughts about things. And what I want you to know is, if you disagree with what I say, I still love you. If you disagree with what I say, I'm not mad at you. But sometimes the most loving thing to do is to have an awkward conversation that causes us to really think and pray through and settle in on what do I believe? And the real issue is why do you believe what you believe? Because so often in life we allow our feelings or our opinions or our relationships to shape what we think. So often we're driven by feelings. Remember, remember when you were in seventh grade, guys, that girl you just knew you were going to marry? Like she was the one, and then you didn't marry her, you married somebody else, and you went to your high school reunion and you thought, thank God, thank God, I was wrong. The problem with our feelings is they will take you on a ride that will wreck your life. I, I'm not smart enough, I'm not wise enough, there are too many things I've been wrong about in life for me to be the one who decides what's truth and what's not. God has written it down, and so we trust his opinion. And there are times, there are times we look at the word of God, and it's offensive. 
The idea that you've sinned, that I've sinned, we bristle at that. We don't like that word. And we don't want to be called a sinner. We don't want anybody to talk about our sin. We're okay with the word mistakes, but because we all make them. But the idea of sin, that, that I would think anything, say anything, or do anything that would be displeasing to God, or, or that there are things that God would want me to think or say or do that I don't do. This idea of sin, we, we, we know it's in our lives. It's a condition we have. And we know it's true, but we, we don't like to deal with it. And so the thought that I was broken, I was messed up, I'm a wrecked individual. I couldn't do anything to help myself. And Jesus came and died for me in my place to pay the penalty for my sin. And that my only hope for knowing God, my only hope for salvation, my only hope for an eternity with God is if I receive Jesus as my Savior. That can be offensive. But you have a responsibility and you owe it to yourself to decide Who's the authority for your life, God or you? And sometimes one of the greatest things we can do is be a part of looking at something that can be intense or awkward and growing through it and learning from it. See, we're the kind of church that celebrates changed lives. We're the kind of church that celebrates changed opinions. We're not going to crucify you because of something you said 10 or 12 years ago. We believe that our God is a God of hope and he can change lives and he can make people that were unloving, loving, people that were unkind, kind, people that were not peaceful, peaceful, and he can radically do something in our lives. And so, hey, we we don't want to tear down lives. We want to build bridges. And that's what we are all about. And in this passage, before, before we get to the tense part, Paul takes a walk down memory lane. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so it's fully the Word of God, but the Holy Spirit is writing it through Paul. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Chinchere. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and give her any help she may need from you, for she has been been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend, Apentus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. The first 15 or so verses really goes through Paul reminiscing, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So God is wanting to to say some things about these people. He does it through Paul, but he's reminiscing about people that have been special to him. People that have made a difference. Maybe for you it was your first grade teacher, or maybe it was a coach, or maybe it was a family member. Somebody that that meant something in your life, that poured into you. And so through these verses, he's bringing that out. Last Sunday, Angie and I were in Texas, the motherland, where I'm from. And we were were there because I'd received a letter and was invited, uh, because I grew up in that church and I'm a pastor now. I was invited to come back last weekend was the 150th anniversary of that church. So uh, we didn't meet anybody that was around in the beginning, but, uh, but we went back and we saw people we haven't seen in 35 years. People like, people like Dr. Krim. He was a dermatologist in that city in Beaumont, just about an hour east of Houston. And he taught the Bible study class for, for my age when I was a junior in high school. Made a huge difference in my life. We didn't get to see Larry Doolin, who was also a Bible study teacher. He's, he's passed away, but he was the first guy that came to my home and said, hey, I, I want to make sure you know Jesus. I want to make sure you understand what that relationship's about. And at the time, I was not a Christ follower, but it started the process of me thinking. We saw Miss Carpenter. We haven't seen her in years. And she was so influential and did such a great job of investing in and building that church that made a difference in my life. We saw, we saw Ernie Brown, the church attorney. Yeah, God loves attorneys. We saw Ernie Brown, the church attorney, and he's just been so instrumental in, help, instrumental in helping the church be all it could to make a difference in people's lives. And, and I, I could go on and on and on about the people we reconnected with. Steve Turrentine, who was the first youth pastor I had when I went into student ministry when I was in sixth grade, and the most phenomenal youth pastor I ever had. And uh, he, he looks like Tom Selleck. I don't know if that helped him or not. But 
It was so incredible to connect. And so I was thinking about this week and reading the words of Paul here. I understand the affection and being drawn to certain people because of the difference they've made in my life. And that's what he's rolling through right here. And you've experienced that as well. But what's interesting to me, and it's so easy to miss at a casual reading or a glance, because there's sometimes, let's be honest, there's sometimes we get to pages of Scripture, and in those pages, it's very easy to miss something deeper, especially when you roll through a section where there are a bunch of names of people that you don't know and some of them you can't pronounce. It's, it, it, it's easy to miss the meaning, but there's something here. And I don't think it's a coincidence because our God is a very intentional God. In these verses, when Paul is going to say, I want to thank some people, I want to commend some people, I want to say something special to some people, inspired by the Holy Spirit, put here on purpose, the first three people Paul mentions are women. At a day and time in a culture when women were diminished and often looked at as property, they're the first to come to Paul's mind when he wants to thank people. He's, he's grateful for them and their influence in his life. And I was thinking about that and thought about the fact that Jesus has done and does do more to elevate properly women than anyone else or anything else that's ever happened. There are world religions that devalue and diminish the value of women. But Jesus here elevates them to their proper place, made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. So ladies, you are made in the image of God. There are aspects of the nature and the makeup of God that are placed in you specifically that you have. Now guys, we also in the last few years have become a culture that loves to bash men. But the reality is you are made in the image of God. There are things about your aspect and your, who you are, your nature that God placed in you. We are made in the image of God. Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And now, to some, that's offensive. Because our world has decided, apart from reality, apart from science, apart from truth, our world has decided it's, it's, not, it's not just male and female. It's whatever you feel or whatever you want to be. But the reality is, no matter who you are, how you feel, when they dig up your bones, if they do 100 years after you've died, it will say you were a man or you were a woman. And it's the only two options we find in Scripture. And the problem is, if you take that position, you're viewed as hateful. You're supposed to shut up and sit down. You're viewed as somebody that's wrong about things. And in our culture, you deserve to be erased and canceled. But here's how I approach this. I have a responsibility. And my responsibility, listen, I love you and I like you. And I want you to like me. Like, I'm not wackadoodle. <laughs> I, I'm not, I didn't wake up this morning and say, okay, what can I say to really piss them off? That, like, that's not who I am. I want you to like me. But the reality is, I am chasing the approval of God above anybody else. And what I do, I do for an audience of one. So while I love you, I have a responsibility to say, hey, here's what Scripture teaches, and you get to decide if you want the Bible to be the authority in your life or not. But your decision does not make it any less true. And the reality is Scripture says some very clear things about God's idea for people, for family, for marriage, and how we're supposed to live at the best level. And I think of what Paul wrote to Timothy, where he said, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The problem is we have a culture of people, even often in the church, where we think we're smarter than God. 
and we think we figured some things out that maybe God was wrong about, because after all, the Bible written 2,000 years ago has to be outdated. I mean, God, God had no idea what 2022 would be like. I mean, he just, he's an old guy with a long beard, doesn't know much. That's not who God is. And the reality is, there is a way that God says, this is the way you live life, and your feelings will lie to you. Now, if you disagree with what I just said, I love you. If you disagree with what I just said, I'm not mad at you. All I am, I, I'm just the guy delivering the mail. Like, that's all I am. I didn't write it, but I have responded. In fact, I owe it to you not to just tell you what you want to hear. I owe it to our church not to just lead us where we want to go. I have to lead us where we need to go. And I have to deal with some awkward subjects sometimes that the Bible deals with, but my heart and my motivation is out of a love for you. I, I don't hate you, and I refuse to allow the definition of hate that our culture puts on people. Disagreement is not hate. And if you disagree with me, I don't hate you. If you walk up to me and you say, listen, I, I don't like white men. Tough cookies, man. You're missing out. If you say, hey, I don't believe in marriage, all right? See, I am secure enough in who God is and what he's done in my life. I don't need you to validate it. And so if you get offended because of what God says, you're looking for validation from people. You should be secure enough in what you believe. The problem is the reason you struggle with that, we need everybody to validate our opinions today because we know there are cracks in it. And we wrestle with that. We wrestle with the idea of how to define a woman or a man. I could do that when I was five. But we have complicated what God makes very, very simple. And we've done it in chasing what we want over what God wants, thinking we will achieve a level of life that is absolutely impossible unless you let God be your God and you live the way God says, here's how I designed life. It's awkward. It's tough. I don't want you to not like me. But if you don't, I'm okay with it. Because my responsibility is to say, here's what God says. Your responsibility, you owe it to yourself. For, you, for yourself to decide, do I believe the Bible is the word of God or not? Do I believe the Bible is the authority for life or not? And sometimes the gospel, gospel is a Bible word that simply means good news. The gospel is offensive. It speaks to issues of our day. It speaks to gender, it speaks to marriage, it speaks to how to treat people. And I don't find anywhere in the Bible that it says, if you disagree with somebody, it's okay to hate them or you need to pursue erasing them. I, I don't read anywhere in scripture where it says that you and I as Christ followers need to tell people to shut up. We should not be afraid of the free exchange of ideas and we should be secure enough in who we are and what the word of God says and who God is in our lives to be okay with people saying something we don't like or agree with and still learning to be kind to them even though we may not feel it. And part of the problem is, as a church, we've been hateful at times. I don't mean C3, I mean the church at large. Pastors have earned a great reputation of being judgmental and being hateful, and that doesn't represent Jesus well at all. But neither is it okay to leave out things the Word of God clearly addresses under the guise of not wanting to offend anybody. If you're offended, you're not offended with me, you're offended with Scripture. Your problem's not with me, it's with the Bible. And you've got to decide for you what you believe about that. And no matter what you believe, no matter where you land on that issue, if you disagree with me, I love you. You're wrong, but I, <laughs> but I love you. All the churches of Christ send greetings. And then, then he gets into some correction. A couple weeks ago, I shared with you Romans chapter 15, and it was very encouraging because encouragement is important, and it's important in our lives. We make sure that we're encouraging people around us and make sure they feel encouraged and built up, not enabled to participate or be involved in something that's ultimately going to harm them or those they love, but encouraged where we can. But in chapter 16, he's wrapping up the whole book, and he brings a little bit of correction and for some of us in this room, maybe what you need today is comfort and encouragement, and I pray that God does that. But for some of us, maybe what you need today is correction, and I want to always, I want us to always to be open to. Our posture in the life of C3 is whatever God says, we give it a yes, whether we like it or not, whether we agree or not. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, he's using the language of family. There's a spiritual family called the church. If you're a Christ follower, you are a part of that. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you've learned. Keep away from them. He's saying there are some people that cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. Now, he's speaking to a very specific issue in history. The details have changed, and in some ways, what happens has changed, but the principle remains the same. What was happening in that culture is that the Jewish people who had come to the conclusion that Christ is the Messiah decided, the religious leaders decided, that for a Gentile to come to Jesus, they had to become a part of the Jewish religion first. So you couldn't just come to Jesus, you had to agree to keep the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. You couldn't just come to Jesus, you had to agree to keep all the things they wanted to add to the rules of how you were supposed to be religious. You couldn't just come to Jesus, you had to become Jewish first. Guys, if you were a Gentile, you you couldn't just come to Jesus, you had to be circumcised, and, and that killed church growth. That's when ladies started coming to church instead of guys. No, thank you. Like, and if you don't know what circumcision is, circumcision, I'm not just kidding. I'm not doing that. But C3 kids, parents, put your kids in C3 kids. They learn about Jesus on their level in C3 kids because sometimes I might pop off about something. But I I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Anything that tells you it's Jesus plus is wrong. It's just Jesus. All you need is Jesus. You can come as you are. You can come with how you believe. You can disagree with some things in the Bible. The only thing that you need to do is give your life to Jesus. He takes care of everything else. You don't have to fix anything before you come. You don't have to change anything before you come. In fact, you can even keep coming when you're not sure and be a part of what God's doing and grow and learn, and that's okay. It's just Jesus. But he says, this is interesting. He says, keep away from them. He's about to lay out three categories of people as it relates to this text. And you have options as we talk about this. If you find yourself in a category that you don't like, you have options. You, through the Spirit of God, can change your category. He talks about evil people. And he says, evil people live by the enemy's power, by a demonic power. He's going to talk about foolish people. He says, foolish people just live by the flesh, live by their feelings. Just every day it's what do I want to do and how do I want to do it? And sometimes feelings, I don't know if you know this, sometimes feelings are the slow slow burn grenade that will blow up your life when you follow those feelings. And he said, some people are just, just foolish. They live day by day by how they feel. So there's evil people that live by the enemy's power. There's foolish people that live by the flesh. And then there's wise people who live by the spirit. I read one author that said, evil people are like wolves, foolish people are like sheep, and wise people are like shepherds. Evil people are negative toward the things of God, foolish people are neutral toward the things of God, and wise people are positive toward the things of God. And he gives a very strong warning about evil people. He says they they cause problems, they stir up divisions, they create obstacles between people coming to Jesus and obstacles between people getting connected with church. He says, evil people are intentionally dangerous and intentionally cause pain and harm. Foolish people cause pain and harm, but they do it accidentally. They're just not thinking about it. Notice, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And you know what I've noticed? Maybe this has been your story and your journey as well. It's certainly true in Scripture. Sometimes the most evil people are the most religious. The people who opposed Jesus the most were highly religious. And they felt the most justified. They they were trying to honor and promote God by fighting against God. And and they had all of their justifications. Usually, evil people are broken people. Now, we're all broken on some level. 
But people that are evil, someone harmed them, so they harm others. Usually, and very often, it's people that become highly religious and live in a judgmental way and have rituals and rules and lists that they feel like they need to keep, and you're not good enough if you don't live according to their list. And usually that comes from some sort of pain in the past, something that's been done to them that they've not gotten over, they've chosen not to forgive, and because of that, they've not found healing. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Evil people are relationally deceptive. If you're a person who's proud, they will flatter you. If you're a person who's lonely, they will befriend you. They know how to play you. They cause divisions. They create a us versus them mentality. And they create obstacles to people coming to Jesus and church. And they're filled with conflict and drama and relational tension. Wait, wait, wait. Pastor, I I thought you said every single person we lock eyes with is deeply loved by God. That's true. I thought you said we're, we're supposed to use our influence to try to help reach people for Christ. That's true. But we have to understand that evil people are not beyond help, but they are beyond your help. Because only God can change them. We spend a lot of emotional energy sometimes trying everything we can and exhausting all of our emotional resources on trying to change someone. Do you understand that you can't change anybody? Neither can I. Only God can change people, but that's especially true when it comes to people that are evil. Now, some of you, you you live to help people. You kind of live with a savior mentality. You roll into the day wanting to be a hero and to save people. You can't save evil people. You can't save anybody. But we have to understand you can't save evil people. And sometimes we encounter people that are evil. How do we define evil? People that on purpose, intentionally, with forethought and planning, harm or hurt other people. People that live in a way that they devalue other human beings. And what I've discovered is Usually, there's only a few evil people. Now, there are a lot of foolish people that will go along for the ride and be influenced. But but evil people is a unique category. It's not the masses. It's it's a few. And sometimes we encounter these people and we think, well, if I just love them, if I do things for them, if I spend time with them, if I hang out with them, then I'll be able to change them. You won't. People that truly have this bent... Only God can change. Evil people, they need professional help. With evil people, we have cautious relationships. And when it says keep away with them, it means keep a distance. It doesn't mean you don't invite them to church. Invite them to church. It doesn't mean that you don't have conversations occasionally. It just means they're not in the inner circle of your life where they will shape how you think and how you feel and impact your worldview and your view of the relationships you have. They will create a less than life for you if you allow them to influence you. So with evil people, we have cautious relationships. With with foolish people, we can have caring relationships. But there need to be some boundaries. There need to be some guidelines. Because the scripture says the companion of fools, the person who hangs out with fools, will suffer harm. You don't even have to be a fool. You just have to let people that live in a foolish way, careless, not really thinking about things, not intentionally trying to harm, but just over and over again, letting what they want guide their life in that moment, moment by moment, and with disregard to how it's going to impact others, they, don't, they just don't think about it. You don't want to be influenced by them. With people who are wise, we can have connected relationships. Who is it in your life that's wise? From a biblical perspective... Who are the people in your close circle, people that influence you? Who are the people in your life that help you love God more just because of how they live and their relationship with you? Who are the people in your life that make you want to be more like Jesus because of how they live and how they interact with people? Who are the people that bring wisdom to your life that help you see things you didn't see and help you navigate things in an elevated way beyond how you normally navigate them and and they help you live more of the life you were created to live? Who are those people? Evil people should not get much of your time. They should get none of your energy, and they should have no access to your emotions. You've heard the line, we don't negotiate with terrorists. 
Evil people are spiritual terrorists. And the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul, watch out for them. Be discerning. And when you encounter someone like this, avoid letting them into your inner circle. See, some people, though, they've, they've weaponized the Bible and they've twisted it to have a meaning to fulfill their agenda. And sometimes when you distance people and they know that they're not getting much closer, they might say something like, you're, you're supposed to love me. You're a Christ follower. You're, I, I, I know I blew up your world, but you're supposed to forgive me and you're supposed to reconcile with me. Love and forgive, yes. Reconcile, not always. Love, forgiveness, and relationship are three different things. If you have kids and you were to take them over to a friend's house to spend the night, and you, you've got a son maybe that's five years old, and you find out the next day when you come to pick them up, they let your five-year-old hang out all night. He got home at 4 a.m., and then you find out they fed him chocolate cake and ice cream for breakfast, which if you're five is not a bad deal. Then you find out after breakfast they let him play with knives. You might love them, you, you might forgive them, but little Jethro ain't ever spending the night there again. Reconciliation has nothing to do with love and forgiveness. And the problem is we put ourselves often in a position of being an emotional hostage because we believe to forgive you means we gotta be best friends again. Not at all. Sometimes there are people you need to forgive that have died. There's no way to reconcile the relationship. Forgiveness and reconciliation have nothing to do with each other. And often the most difficult people that are evil, the most difficult people to deal with that are evil, often they're in your extended family. Some of you let extended family treat you in a way that you would not let anybody else treat you. You think because you have the same last name, you're supposed to give passes on how they behave and what they do to you or your kids that you would not give to anyone else. And it's not true. Just because they have the same last name does not mean that they get to bring harm to your life over and over again and function in a way that's truly harmful to you. The Bible says if people are evil, avoid them. Think about it. One of the most evil people Jesus dealt with had to be Judas. Judas. I mean, Judas wasn't just foolish, he was evil. For three years, he stole, from, he stole from Jesus. Then he becomes a part of a plot that sets up Jesus being arrested and murdered on a cross. That, that, that's Judas. And the last conversation Jesus ever had with Judas, he said, you go do what you plan to do, I'm gonna go do what I need to do. They never had a conversation again. See, we've bought into a thinking that's shrinking who God called us to be. We believe we're supposed to think, well, everybody's a good person. How many times have you had, heard the phrase from a friend, or maybe you've even said it, with someone who has blown up their marriage and hurt their spouse, devastated their children, we, we tell the story of the devastation, and then we say something like, but he has a good heart. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. In fact, did you know the Bible says the heart is deceitful and wicked? Who can know it? We, we don't even know our own heart. We don't even know our emotions. Your emotions will lie to you and put you on a ride that will wreck your life. Don't ever be the kind of person that thinks you know yourself well enough, and don't ever be the kind of person that thinks you are beyond certain things and certain sins. You're not. He doesn't have a good heart. He has a sinful heart. We know this. We like to talk about people as being good, but we, we know there are some jacked up people in the world. It's, it, it's the reason you lock your doors at night. It's the reason you have an alarm system in your home. We, we know that there are some people that are messed up. In fact, if you're from Texas, it's the reason you lock your doors at night, you have an alarm system in your home, you have guns in your home and a big dog. Because we know, hey, there's, there's some people that will mess up your world. There are some people that will harm your family. We know it's true. We know there are bad people in the world. So we know we need to lock up our home. Now, we're not worried about our country or the southern border, but we know we got to lock up our home because there are some messed up people in the world. That was not a political statement. It was a true statement. And even if you don't like it, you know it because you lock your house and set your alarm. Separate message. Get back. But then Paul speaks to foolish people. 
Verse 18, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good. Wise about what is good. Wise about what is good. I want you to live the life God created you to live. And I want you to means there is a possibility to miss it. You're not going to automatically live the life God created you to live. You're not going to accidentally live the life God created you to live. It takes bringing intentionality to your own life and owning your own spiritual condition. I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent of what is evil. Now, there's a little dose of reality in this when he talks about foolish people. We're all foolish in some ways in some seasons of life. We're all ignorant about some things. There are things we we just don't know about yet. And you can be wise in some areas in life and foolish in other areas. You can be good with money and bad with relationships. You can be good at your job and bad at your marriage. It's not that foolish people are less informed or less educated. It's that they are less obedient. It's not that they don't know enough. It's that they don't always do what they know. The biblical pattern for success has always been consistency in obeying what the Word of God teaches. Prior to COVID, I was in the gym four days a week. COVID turned the world upside down. They closed the gyms, and so I took about a two-year vacation. We got a Peloton bike, and I was pretty consistent with that for a little while. And then it seemed like the Peloton bike is better at holding the clothes we need to hang up than (laughs) me using it. it, it, It's not that the bike doesn't work. It's that I'm not working the bike. And so a couple weeks ago, I decided, hey, I'm done with this. I'm tired of being in my eighth trimester. I got to do something about this. And so I started doing that last night. Last night, I jumped on the Peloton bike, about killed myself, almost had to call 911. And this morning, I walked in the room thinking, how am I getting up those steps? What, we need to put a ramp in. We need to do something. But so often in life, we bring our excuses to the table. It's not that the bike doesn't work. It's that I'm not working the bike. It's not that the Bible doesn't work. It's that you're not working the Bible. You're not doing what God says, and who better to know how to live life than the guy that invented it? And he, he has your best interest at heart in everything he says, because he doesn't want you to miss this life. Remember what Jesus said? I came to give you life to the full, life that's overflowing, not just in heaven, but even in right now. And how many areas of your life are an absolute train wreck because you know what this book says, but you just refuse to do it? You refuse to be consistent. But I'm, I need to be clear, I'm, I'm not talking down to you, I'm with you. I have a PhD in stupid. And there's so many times I know what scripture teaches, but in those moments that I'm, I'm foolish, I let me do what I want to do instead of following what scripture teaches. Foolish people approach problems with excuses. Life is full of problems. And with problems, you and I have two options. We can make a plan to fix it or make an excuse to cover it. Those are our two options with every problem. Make a plan to fix it or make an excuse to cover it. And foolish people have great excuses. Hey, please, if you want a better life, if you want to live the life God created you to live, don't waste your energy on making excuses. Invest your energy in making plans. Foolish people are naive. They're gullible. They get sucked into unhealthy decisions. They get sucked into unhealthy relationships. And foolish people do not make the changes that are necessary until life gets extremely painful and they have to. See, life is always moving in a direction. Nobody lives a stagnant life. Even though there are seasons it feels like that, nobody lives life treading water. You're always moving in one direction or the other. And in this passage, part of what Paul's trying to point out is you're either moving toward wisdom or toward evil. You don't stay at the address of foolish your whole life. You stay at foolish long enough, it turns into something you don't want, and you turn into something nobody wants. The Holy Spirit wants to lift you up by his word while temptations are trying to tear you down. You you look at the disciples of Jesus. Judas was evil. Peter, (laughs) Peter was foolish. He says and does a whole lot of impulsive and wrong things. He has a strong temper. He reacts without thinking it through. They're in the garden and they're coming to arrest Jesus. And Peter's the guy that grabs a sword and cuts a guy's ear off. And Jesus is like, no, we don't play like that. And he puts the ear back on. 
Now, I've always wondered why the ear, like if I'm picking up a sword, I'm not going for your ear, I'm going for your heart. But, but Peter, he's just so impulsive, he, he just reacts and does something because sometimes we confuse activity with spirituality. Sometimes we think if I'm just doing something, it means something. And often you are on the hamster's treadmill getting nowhere but running fast and exhausting yourself because you just react to stuff. You see something on social media, bless God, I'm going to get them back. A lot of us have more courage in our thumbs than we do in our hearts. And you jump into an impulsive reaction to somebody. It's just foolish. How many things have you posted that you deleted? How, how many things have you put out there that later you thought, oh, how many conversations have you had where you had to go back later and say, I'm sorry. That, that was just foolish. We can all be foolish. It happens in each of our lives, but Peter lets his emotions drive him. But what does Jesus do with the person who's foolish? The person who's evil, he says, you go do your thing, I'll go do my thing. And there's never another conversation. But with Peter, the person who's foolish, he never gives up on him. In fact, after Peter denies him three times, he asks Peter three times, do you love me? And then he chooses to launch the church through Peter. Because Jesus doesn't give up on foolish people. He pastors them. And then there are wise people. Verse 19, everyone has heard about your obedience. Did you know the wisest thing you can ever do is obey what Scripture teaches? The wisest... Even the parts you don't like. Even the parts, have you ever had that thought, if I was God, I'd make I-4 12 lanes. If I was God, like, I mean, have you ever thought what you'd do if you were God? There's some people that wouldn't still be breathing if some of you were God. Like, you would take them out. Everyone has heard about your obedience. So I rejoice because of you. Remember those people he lists in the first few verses? Priscilla and Aquila. Remember those people? Who rejoices because of you? Who, who, who rejoices because of your influence and how, because you try to live in a wise way? You're not, you're not perfect. None of us are. You're going to make stupid decisions sometimes. All of us do. But the default position of your life, you're becoming more like Jesus year after year after year. And it doesn't feel like it in the moment. But you look up one day, Ellie, our little granddaughter, I think she's eight months old. Is that right? Eight months old? I'm not supposed to know all that stuff. I'll just try to remember eight months old. While we were in Texas, she started crawling. Now, it's been months. Now, the secret is I saw her crawl before we left, but that's a separate story. But anyway, she started crawling. And you look at that, man. You watch your kids, and it seems like it takes forever, and then it happens. And pretty soon she'll be walking. And the growth that happens in our physical life sometimes seems so slow. But when you look up a year later, two years later, three years later, ten years later, you look at the, the momentum and the growth that's taking place. The same thing's true spiritually. There are moments where it feels like nothing's happening. But God does his best work often in nothing's happening. There were 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament while God was preparing the world for the birth of Jesus. And it felt like nothing was happening. It, during the pregnancy, unless you're the mom, for a long time it seems like nothing's happening. Okay, I hear we're having a baby, but... God does his best work in the moments where it seems like nothing's happening. And then he delivers often in a way that we never saw coming. He's sending the king to earth. He's sending the son of God to earth. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm God, man, he's, he's riding on a big horse. He's got a spirit, not a Florida State Seminole, but, but he's, he's got some, sorry about that last night, guys, but, but he's got some stuff. Like if I'm picturing God sending his son to earth, man, there's lightning and flashes and all that. But God doesn't deliver in the way we think he should. He sends his son in the hushed cries of a baby where it feels quiet and empty and it feels like it should be more. But it's more than we ever needed. We just don't know it yet. Sometimes life is like that. And wisdom is understanding that growth happens even in the quiet moments and that God is present and leans in even in the hurting moments. And even when it feels like nothing's happening and you're obeying and you're trusting God and you're praying and you're seeking God and you're following and you're, you're doing the best you can to allow the Spirit of God to transform your life on the inside and apply the teachings of Scripture. And it feels like often when you do that, things get worse, not better. It's because you have an enemy who's trying to throw some obstacles in your way so that you'll quit. How many people quit in the fourth quarter when they could have won the game? How often do we stop pursuing God because it gets harder? You have an enemy, 
Expect it. Be wise. Know that it's coming. Wisdom is not a level of education or intelligence. It's humility and obedience. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now to him who is able to establish you, that means to firmly root you, to plant you on a solid foundation, to put you in a place where your growth is immeasurable. To him who is able to establish you in accordance with the gospel, the good news, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our culture places a high value on intelligence and not a lot of value on wisdom. Sometimes those who are brilliant are evil. Sometimes those who think they're really, really smart are screwing a lot of stuff up. In America, that's what we call college. People that are evil. <laughs> People, there are some amazing educators that love Jesus, but there's some jacked up stuff happening. People that are evil don't want to change and don't want to learn. People that are foolish, you have to stay on them. You got to track them down. You got to pray for them. When they're struggling, you have to pursue them. People that are wise, they will pursue you. They'll send you a text. They'll make a phone call and they'll say, hey, I'm, I'm not doing good. I need help. They recognize and they confront their issues and they take responsibility for their own well-being. And when you say to people, here's where you are and why, wise people listen and say, thank you for telling me. And they pay attention. And they don't take your word as the word of Jesus. You only do that with Scripture. But they'll process it and they'll pray through it and they'll analyze it and they'll think and they'll evaluate. And wise people will have the courage to confront the reality of their situation even when it's uncomfortable. And they'll thank you for it. Foolish people, when you tell them here's what's going on and here's why, they'll argue with you. They'll justify their lack of obedience to the Bible. But you keep loving. Because just like with foolish people, God can use you to help change their lives, just like with Peter and what Jesus did. You keep loving. You keep pursuing. So where do you land? Are you evil? Are you foolish? Are you wise? If you don't like where you are, you have options. You can ask the Spirit of God to turn and change your heart. You can be open to what God has to say. And rather being defensive to truth of Scripture, you can embrace it even when it's uncomfortable because the greatest growth happens in uncomfortable places. I've never met anybody that went to the gym and did the bench press or a curl or shoulder shrugs, shrugs or ran on a stupid death treadmill. I've, I've never met anybody that did that that thought, you know, I was really comfortable. I felt so good. I enjoyed myself. You feel good after because of the growth that takes place. But it's when you go to uncomfortable places and you have the courage to allow some uncomfortable truth to sink into your life that God will grow all the muscles of who you are in your soul and create something in you that you never thought you could be because you allow him to change you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for this morning. For our time together, and God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for amazing people that allow me the freedom as pastor to simply share what your word teaches and that we each decide where we land on it and what we do with it. But God, I pray through your spirit you would open our eyes, help us see and apply truth and that Sunday morning wouldn't be the bike we never use but that we would work what you shared with us this morning, what your scripture teaches in this final chapter of Romans, that we would bring it into our lives and live in a way that is obvious that we love you and love others. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today, and you know the greatest need of your life is to invite Jesus to come into your life. Maybe you know about God, but do you know God personally? And I, I, I can't think of a better day than today to give your life to Christ if you've never done that. There is not a wiser move you can make in life. In fact, wisdom begins with inviting Jesus to come into your life forgive your sin, give you a home in heaven and live with you in this life through life to help you live it the way God intended, your best life. So if you'd like to do that, if you'd like to invite Jesus to come into your life, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. You can pray out loud or you can pray in the quietness of the moment in your heart. The Bible says in Matthew chapter six that Jesus knows even our thoughts. So if you'd like to invite Christ to come into your life, 
man, there's no greater wisdom. This is where it starts. Just pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that I need you. Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive my sin and help me to live for you. Thank you for loving me. As best I know how, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. If you just prayed that prayer, we would love to know it. You can text your name to 407-487-8311, and Pastor Byron will be praying for you this week. And also, we want to thank you for your faithful generosity. You can go to giveC3.cc, or you can text C3Orlando to 77977. Thank you so much for how you give. And if you are in Central Florida, please join us in person at our campus at 9.30 or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Have a great week.